Dimensions of the Daf with Rabbi Mordechai Becher on JBS is made possible in part by the B.L. Manger Foundation in memory of Ben Manger. Hi, I'm Mordechai Becher, and welcome to Jewish Broadcasting Service, Dimensions of the Duff, uh, in which we explore things from uh, ideas from the Talmud, of philosophy, of halacha, Jewish law, Jewish thought. Um, we do it sometimes from the text of the Talmud, often, usually do it from the text of the Talmud, sometimes from uh, works written after the Talmud, uh, those who saw the one about responsa literature, and uh, sometimes just Talmudic methodology, even if not in the Talmud itself. So today, I want to look at something really from, from, uh, from really from the from the prophets, the books of the prophets, uh, in the book of Samuel one and the book of Samuel two, Shmuel Aleph and Shmuel Beis. So, um, and this is based on a question which the Gemara asked. The Gemara Talmud asked a question: Ma bein Shaul leDavid? What's the difference between Shaul and David? Who are Shaul and David? I'll translate: Saul and David. So the first king of Israel, as you probably know, was Saul, S-A-U-L, Shaul in Hebrew. And the second was King David. Uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, the lineage of King David is considered to be the eternal lineage of the king. His dynasty is the eternal dynasty of the, of the monarchy of the Jewish people, and the Mashiach, the Messiah, must be descended from the house of King David. Shaul, the first king, died a tragic death uh, during war on Mount Gilboa and uh, his children were also killed and his lineage, his dynasty did not continue. It's interesting a little bit that the word Shoal, uh, which, mean, which is his name, in Hebrew also means borrowed, a, an allusion to the idea that he was, it was so to speak, borrowed time. He was not the one who would be the eternal king uh, or his dynasty, but... Um, Tragically, it was borrowed. He was a righteous man, and he was a scholar. But we have an interesting uh, distinction. So let me start with Shoal. Samuel 1, verse 15. We have uh, Shoal, Saul, being commanded to make war against Amalek. Amalek were the uh, ancient, eternal enemies of the Jewish people. And they, were, they attacked us when we came out of Egypt, we had wars with them at many, many times throughout our history. And the first thing that Shoal was commanded to do as king was to make war against the Amalekites. It's a little rough for us to understand. I say a little as an understatement, but he was told to completely wipe out the Amalekites. Horrific. Um, but let's accept for the moment the way it's given in the in the, books of, uh, in the book of Samuel, God gave him an explicit command to do this, as much as he didn't want to and didn't like it, and as horrific as it sounds, let's assume for the moment that if God gave him that command, he has to do it. And part of it was to kill the animals as well, probably because uh, it was to show that we were not doing this for material gain, for looting, uh, for, uh, for economics, but rather it was to destroy this evil from the world. Uh, however, what Shaul did was he left the cattle alive and he also left the king, Agag, alive. So he left this king of the Amalekites alive. Maybe he thought that the humility of captivity was worse than killing him. I don't know what he thought, but in fact, he did not do what God said. So Samuel the prophet comes to him. And he says, uh, and, and, he, and he, you know, he sees him and he says, um, Here's, uh, they tell Shoal is coming to see you. Um, and Shoal says, comes and greets Samuel the prophet and says, Peace unto you. He says, Baruch atal Hashem, blessed are you unto God. Hakimoisi est bar Hashem, I fulfilled the world of God. I did what God said. So Samuel the prophet says, well, hold on. What is the sound that I can hear? I hear sheep. I hear cattle. Where, where is that from? So Shoal says, oh, he says, they, the people, had pity 
on the cattle and they looted them. They brought them from Amalek. And uh, they're going to bring it as a sacrifice to God. So he says, well, so he says two things here. He says, A, the people did this. And B, they're going to do it as a sacrifice. So Shmuel says, let me tell you what God said to me. First of all, God said to me last night that although you are humble in your own eyes, and you are a humble person, but he says, I made you king of Israel. You shouldn't be listening to the people. You should be doing, you should be leading the people. And he says, and secondly, he said, God doesn't want sacrifices. He wants you to listen to his word. What do you think is better, bringing an offering or listening to the word of God? He says, listening to the word of God. So then Shoal says, but, but you know, we, we, I, I listen to God, but we're going to bring him as offerings. And then Shmuel, then, then Shmuel says, you know what? God is going to take away the kingdom from you. And he will, and and. And he says, and he turns to walk away. And Shoal the king grabs the cloak of Shmuel and it tears. And Shmuel says to him dramatically, he says, as you tore my cloak, God will tear the kingdom from your hands. Because you did not listen to his, you did not listen to his voice. He says, but he will not abandon the Jews. His promise to the Jews will be fulfilled by someone else. As we know by King David. And then, we know that eventually Shoal died, but his children didn't take over as kings. They also died. So that's a tragic story of Shoal's end. And then we have another story. Samuel 2, Shmuel Base, chapter 12. In Shmuel Base, chapter 12, we have the story of King David. His army is at war somewhere. And uh, there is a, um, a woman by the name of Bathsheba. He sees her bathing. He uh, has a tremendous desire for her and she is, of course, married. And uh, he, um, her husband's name is Uriah and Uriah is in the army of King David. And um, King David takes Bathsheba and he sends Uriah to the front lines. I'm obviously skipping over a lot of details here and obviously also should be understood in the context of the fact that in the Jewish army for thousands of years, uh, it was customary to give a conditional divorce to the wife when a, a, a soldier went out to battle for obvious reasons. He would do this because if he disappeared, if he was captured, if his body was not recovered, this woman would not know he's alive or dead, could not remarry. So this way, the divorce is, if I don't come back by this and this time, you are divorced from now, etc. And it was a divorce of love rather than of hate. But, okay, that is true. And halachically, no question, legally, that is true. As a king also, he had the right to send anyone he wanted to the front line, especially since, as is pointed out by the commentaries, Uriah referred to the commander of the army as my master and ignored the command of the king, which is, again, a treasonous act which according to Jewish law is also punishable by death. I'm leaving aside all that. Why? Because I want to focus on what the prophet, uh, the prophet uh, Nossan, Nath Nathan, Nathan, the prophet says to King David. After all this happens, Uriah is dead. He's killed by the Ammonites on the front line. But Sheva is now married to King David. And now the prophet Nath Nossan, the prophet Nathan, comes to King David and this was the job of the prophets, uh, he comes to the king and he says, let me ask you something. I, wanna, I want your opinion. Two men live in a city. One's wealthy. He has huge flocks of sheep. He has heads of cattle. He's a wealthy guy. The other guy, he's poor. He has one sheep. The wealthy guy kills the poor guy and takes his only sheep because he wants that sheep. He says, what would you say about a guy like that? King David says, such a man is deserving of death. So Nosson, Nathan the prophet says, you are that man. King David says, what, what? He says, yes. He says, you're the king. You're wealthy. You have concubines. You have wives. He says, Uriah, you took his wife. You killed him through the sword of the Ammonites. He says, you are that man that I'm talking about. So, 
By the way, I think it's an amazing and fantastic thing that a prophet can talk to the king that way. It's an important thing. You know, politicians, kings, they need someone like that who can say anything he wants to him, however he wants. And that's really happened a lot of times throughout the, throughout the history of the, uh, the Torah and the prophets. You had prophets who were, whose job it was to yell at the king. Some, some of them got thrown, Yirmiyahu got thrown in jail for doing it. Some of them had their lives threatened, Eliyahu Anovi. But some of them, like Nathan, Nathan comes to King David, accuses him, Right? Has him condemn him his own self uh, through this story. And then when he tells this to King David, King David says, Khatasi, I have sinned. I've sinned. And Shmuel says, and you will be punished for this sin. He says, the child born from this union will die. And he says, not only that, but your own child will rebel against you and will die tragically. And of course, both of these things happened. And it was terrible punishment. So the child, son of Bathsheba, dies, her first son. But the second son, whose name is Shlomo, King Solomon, he, as it says, as you see on your uh, slide here, at the end of chap- towards the end of chapter 12, it says that King David um, uh, had relations with Bathsheba, his wife. He lay with her. She had a son. She called his name Shlomo. Vashem God loved him. And uh, he was given another name by Nosson the prophet, Yedidya, which means the beloved one of God. And indeed Solomon was promised that he would be the king and he became the king. And the promise was that King David and through Solomon and his children would have the eternal monarchy and dynasty of the Jewish people. So here the commentaries ask, as the Talmud puts it, why is it? So King David is punished terribly for his sin, terrible punishment, loses, a, loses two children and one of them in tragic, horrific circumstances. But nevertheless, he's able to carry on as king and his children. Shoal, King Saul, is not able, his children are not able to carry on as king. Why does Shoal lose the monarchy and King David does not? And there are five answers to this. I don't know if we'll have time for all of them, but five answers. They are summarized by one of the great commentaries, Don Isaac Abarbanel. Abarbanel was a great Torah scholar who was also the financial advisor to Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand of Spain. He was expelled at the um, expulsion 1492, became the advisor to the King and Queen of Portugal, financial advisor in Portugal. Eventually, Jews were expelled from Portugal 1497, forced to convert or leave. He left, he went to Italy, he worked uh, for the uh, government in, uh, I believe, in Venice. Uh, and uh, so he was a, a brilliant financial genius and politician, but he was also a great Torah scholar and wrote extensive commentary on the Torah, the prophets and the writings, which is a monumental, massive and fantastic work, amongst other things. He wrote at least three, four other books that I know of and probably more that I don't know of. So the Abarbanel summarizes uh, five different views. The first, he says is a very simple answer. He says, Shoal, Saul's sin was in, the, was in the monarchy itself. In other words, he didn't conduct war in the way that God wanted him to do so. And, you know, you may have problems with how God commanded him to do so, but let's put that aside for the moment. We just focused on the story as it's presented. So, but, but as a king, what is the main job of the king? One of the main jobs of a king is to wage war against the enemies of his people. So therefore his sin was a failing in his uh, his abilities as king and as leader. King David failed as a human and he repented for that and was punished for it, but he didn't fail as a king. In other words, he carried out the duties of a king correctly. King Saul showed that he was not capable of carrying out the duties of a king correctly. So therefore he says, inasmuch as Saul's sin was in the duties of a king, he lost the monarchy when he sinned. King David's failing was as a human, but as it, so he was punished for that terribly, but he didn't fail as a monarch, and consequently he kept on in the monarchy. The second reason which is given is the repentance. You see, what was Shoal's reaction when he was accused by, by, by Samuel the prophet 
um, of this uh, of doing a sin, his first reaction was to put the blame at the door of the people. He says the Jews wanted to keep uh, the uh, the cattle because they wanted to bring it as zap- sacrifices. So so you see, that's not the way to do repentance. The way to do repentance is to regret and accept responsibility for the sin. Shoal didn't accept responsibility. What was, and not only that, he blamed it on someone else. And even when he did accept responsibility, he claimed that he was doing it for religious reasons, to bring offerings. Well, it's very hard to claim religious reasons as an excuse for not listening to God. I mean, you know, God, religion, right? So, so that, was, that was number two. And King David, in contrast, when he is confronted by the prophet Nossen, Nathan the prophet confronts him, what's King David's reaction? Immediately, I sinned. I'm wrong. So the second answer is, yes, they both did a terrible sin, but one put the blame on others, made excuses, and only afterwards uh, finally admitted to it. The other, King David, immediately admitted to the sin, was contrite, regretted it, and changed. So that was, that's the second distinction. Distinction number three, uh, which is very similar to the first, is that um, the mitzvah that was transgressed, the commandment that was transgressed by King Saul was a commandment specifically given to a king, as king. So that means he transgressed a commandment of the king. You transgress the commandment given to the king, you can no longer be king. King David transgressed a commandment given to anyone. So he can still be king, but he transgressed a commandment that's given to you and I and all of us have, are equally obligated in that commandment. So if he fails in a commandment in which he's equally obligated with all other people, all other humans, so he gets a punishment, yes, but he doesn't lose the kingdom. Similar to the first, just slight difference. Then number four uh, is, uh, the fourth distinction is, that uh, this is how the Abar Brunel understands it, the fourth distinction is that, that, that Saul showed a lack of faith or trust in God. That is to say, here he is, God told him, do this, and this is the right thing to do. You could disagree, you could have questions, and I also, I have, you know, it, it bothers me, this commandment is very disturbing and it's very difficult to understand. Okay, yes, 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 all true. But if literally God comes to you, as, you know, through, the, through an authentic prophet and says, do this, whatever questions you've got, Whatever criticisms you've got, whatever problems you've got, you have to do it. You have to do it. And therefore, when he didn't do that, that showed a lack of trust and faith in God. King David, he gave in to desire, which is, you know, a common human failing. And, uh, but it doesn't show a lack of trust or faith in God. Right? If you're overwhelmed by lust or desire or, or laziness or the, what we call the evil inclination, that's, that, that happens. It happens. It's not an excuse, but it happens. But it's not the same as not trusting or, or accepting the Word of God. There's a very big difference between a person who, who says, well, God said that, but I say differently, and someone who says, I know God said that, but I can't help myself, really. I can't, I can't stop. It's difficult. Etc. That's totally, they're both sins, true. But one is worse, because one is saying, God said this, I say differently. The other is saying, I acknowledge that that's what God said. I acknowledge I did the wrong thing. I can't help myself. That is number four. And number five is is that actually, King David transgressed a negative commandment. God said, don't do something. God said, thou shalt not. And he did. King Saul is told, do this, and he didn't do it. So, which is worse? It's a type of interesting because most of us would probably say it's worse to actively transgress than to passively transgress. But actually, the, the, some commentaries say no. You see, the doing a commandment of God, the positive commandment, is, is, is related to the, what we call love of God. Negative, not transgressing, is related to the fear of God, awe of God. That is to say that the motivation for reaching out and doing something, expanding, and, and that which God says, God says, do A or B or C, and I do it, that's an expression of love. Refraining, holding back, containing yourself, not doing something, that's an expression of fear of God. Which is the higher, which is, which is on a higher plane? Love 
or fear. So our sources tell us, Nachmanides, based on the Talmud and other places, tell us that the love of God is a far higher level than fear of God. And consequently, some say that the refraining from expressing the love of God by doing what God said is actually worse than transgressing the fear of God by doing something which God said not to do. And consequently, Saul didn't show love of God, transgress something in the, in the plane of love of God, because God said, do this, and he didn't. Whereas King David transgressed in the fear of God, God said, don't do this, and he did it. So all in all, which is worse, we would say that it's worse to transgress the love of God than the fear of God. So those are uh, the, the five of the differences between Shoal and David. Again, each of these, they don't agree with each other, but it's interesting to note five different approaches. And of course, as elections uh, in Israel rapidly approach, and there's, you know, uh, we always type of think of this because these are really a lot of our under paradigms of leadership. How does a leader, uh, leaders always, there's no such thing as a leader who doesn't have a failing, who doesn't have something wrong, who hasn't made a mistake. Everyone makes mistakes. So the question is how they deal with it. So you see from some of these approaches, is the mistake or the sin in the area of leadership or is it a sin in their private life? That was one of the answers. Is the, is the sin in something that he specifically commanded as the leader or is it in something which he's commanded as a human? Also a difference. How does he confront the mistake or the sin? Does he accept responsibility or does he blame someone else? Does he accept responsibility or does he claim justification and excuses? Also a big difference. And also, uh, is, this, is, the, is the sin or the mistake, does it show a lack of, of judgment, a lack of understanding, a lack of trust or belief in God or in the law, etc.? Or does it show a human weakness or a frailty in his desires? So all these are quite relevant. You know, I'm not going to tell you, uh, um, you know, make specific comparisons to any particular leaders or politicians. I'm just saying that the, these ancient texts and these ideas of how we see these texts actually have tremendous, tremendous moral ramifications when it comes to us looking at leaders, looking at leadership, and, and, and choosing and understanding what is the appropriate leader and how they should be punished when they make a mistake and so on and so forth. All this from texts from thousands of years old uh, really are very, very relevant and, and, and uh, to our headlines uh, today. Uh, in, in our political uh, lives. So anyway, thank you very much for watching. This is Mordechai Becher with the Jewish Broadcasting Service. Dimensions of the Duff, thank you for tuning in. If you like this, tune in again and to our other shows. And again, each show, Quantum Unit, stands by itself, little, little shot of light uh, from the Talmud. Uh, hopefully you'll tune in again, but if you miss an episode, don't worry because uh, they're not connected aside from the fact that I do all of them. Um, and uh, again, um, if you uh, see me somewhere lecturing, then give me a shout out, Tommy. I saw you on uh, JBS and, uh, and that's always gives me a little bit of a boost because I, I, while I, I, you know, Serge, my cameraman here, is nice to look at, but, but it's, it's nice to know there are other people behind the camera who are actually watching and listening. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, we will uh, see you uh, next time. This is Mordechai Becher, JBS, Dimensions of the Dark. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.